Hey, thank you. So I'll start. Yeah. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Naoki Kono. And uh, thank you for joining this webinar today. So today, I will talk about a machine learning framework, uh, which enables prediction of metabolic system evolution in bacteria. So uh, my name, I'm Naoki Kono, and I'm a PhD student and at the University of Tokyo now. And I was majoring in bioinformatics and system, systems biology when I was undergraduate. And then I experienced two labs so far where I combined evolutionary biology and synthetic biology with informatics. So first, I will talk about my overall research interest. So our life is a so complex system that consists of vast number of cells, and each cell is consisting of vast number of function of diverse genes. And it, those functions are uh, complex, uh, well, related in a complex way to form a uh, gen well, gene regulatory network or a metabolic system, for example. And that kind of so complex biological system has been has evolved so far since the latest common ancestor taking so long time. And there are diverse biological systems on the earth now. So here, my basic question about biology is the what rule underlies the biological system evolution? And by asking this question, I would like to understand why extant systems are as they are and I, uh, and by knowing that rule, I would like to predict life systems emerging in the future. And we may design life systems artificially in the future by following those evolutionary rules. So uh, in order to achieve those goals, I think we need uh, two steps. So first, uh, we need to reconstruct about the past evolutionary processes uh, because what we can see is only the extant species, which is a snapshot of the uh, long-term evolution. And second, after the reconstruction of the evolutionary process, we can extract rule behind the evolutionary processes. So as the first trial, uh, as the first step, um, I was previously doing a, a, development, a development of the computational method for scalable lineage estimation. And I'm not going to detail the, about this today, but the lineage tree here means the phylogenetic tree in evolutionary biology and also the cell lineage tree in developmental biology. And uh, uh, the computational framework we developed called Fractal is uh, reconstruct, uh, it, it, it reconstructs a huge lineage tree from a vast number of input DNA sequences by using a di uh, distributed computing framework iteratively. And then uh, we, after the development of the fractal, the, we demonstrated fractal can reconstruct the lineage tree of more than 200 million DNA sequences within only 1.5 day with uh, 300 threads. And uh, the scalability was 200 fold larger than the, uh, the previous upper limitation of the treatable number of DNA sequences. And as the second step, uh, we next try to extract rules behind evolutionary processes. And this is the main topic of today's talk. And this, top, uh, this study was uh, recently published in Science Advances. So if you're interested, uh, please uh, look at this uh, after this talk. So uh, the basic question in this study is the how predictable the evolution of biological systems is. So we are asking this question because the predictability is so associated with the evolutionary rules. So I mean, the, there, if there are a lot of evolutionary rules and every species are following those uh, shared rules, uh, we will able to predict the evolution, right? So uh, by asking or uh, by measuring the how pre predictable the evolution is, uh, we can we can estimate how many evolutionary rules are underlying those biological system evolution. So again, um, there are diverse species on the earth and each species are evolving by gaining or losing various traits. And although those evolutionary processes seem very unpredictable at a glance, but um, some evolutionary pattern have been reported interestingly, such as gaining or losing the same genes or traits with the same order in different lineages. So if we can detect and consider all of these evolutionary patterns, 
maybe we can predict the future evolution. So uh, this kind of evolutionary patterns uh, was reported in prokaryotic evolution. And we can see the pattern by mapping the evolution. Uh, well, we can visualize the pattern by mapping the phylogenetic distribution of every ortholog. And uh, in the left phylogeny here, we can see the rubisco large subunit gene is acquired always before the rubisco small subunit gene. So uh, as I said, uh, by yeah, if we can detect and consider all the all of those evolutionary order pattern, maybe we can predict the next evolution. So such as uh, predicting species that are more likely to acquire uh, one gene. So in the left figure situation, for example, uh, we can predict that the species that are more likely to acquire gene B will be the species already with gene A. Than, uh, rather than species without gene A. So this kind of predicting evolution has great impacts in various biological fields. Uh, of course, in evolutionary biology, it's important for revealing no random patterns in evolution, but it's also important for medicine if we can predict the emergence of drug resistance pathogens by, uh, by horizontal gene transfers of resistance genes. And also, uh, it's very promising if we can predict the possibility of artificial gene gain and losses by genetic modifications. Um, for example, the plasmid introduction or CRISPR gene knockout, for example. So because of those evolution uh, well, study significance, uh, there are diverse studies on predictability of evolution. However, those previous studies mainly focused on the short-term and DNA sequence level evolution. So what they did was observing uh, relatively short-term evolution by laboratory evolution or artificially creating the target mut mutants to, uh, to create the evolutionary intermediates. And then they discussed the patterns and the uh, predictability of the order of mutations fixed in a population. And their, uh, their study was quite good in terms that they, they can control the environmental, uh, environmental factors uh, such as uh, the, well, I mean, the selective pressure can be controllable in those experimental setup. However, uh, their studies were quite limited in terms that the observable evolution is so limited. It's much shorter than the evolutionary history of life. And also there's no interspecies relationship or interspecies interactions such as horizontal gene transfers from different clays because they are only uh, cultivating one uh, one species in one two. So rather than those previous studies, uh, we focused on the system level evolution predictability, which occurs in much longer time scale. And uh, and in for those evolution, uh, we cannot directly observe that evolutionary processes. So we re uh, instead we reconstructed the long term evolution from genomes of extant species. And then we uh, discuss the patterns and the predictability of the gene gains and losses across phylogeny. And in this context, that ideal target will be the prokaryotic evolution because there are so many genomes available for diverse species. So we can extract rules and discuss the patterns of the evolution uh, from those advanced data set. However, there was a big challenge in this, quest, uh, in this study uh, because there is no such method to detect evolutionary rules comprehensively and measure the predictability. So as our solution, we utilize the machine learning model to train the past evolution and test the predictability of the evolution. So this is the outline of this study. So uh, first I will talk about the method in which we, construct, uh, we combine the ancestral reconstruction method and the evodictor framework, which we uh, developed in this study. And then I will talk about the results from the three different analysis in which we conducted the uh, predictability measurement and the interpretation of evolutionary patterns. And lastly, I will talk about perspect future perspective. And importantly, I will take questions three times. So please ask me if you have questions. So first, I will talk about the method. So let me start with explaining the data set we used. There are two data sets mainly. Uh, the first one is the phylogenetic tree, which was retrieved from a, a bacterial phylogenetic tree from a GTDB. 
And also, uh, we use the gene presence absence table uh, for each metabolic genes for each extant species of bacteria. And uh, we, retrieved, we retrieved this data set from the cake genome database. And here we focused on the metabolic system evolution. So we focused on only on the metabolic genes. And the phylogenetic tree here is so simply illustrated, but the actual one is like this. So huge uh, mega phylogeny. And what we did first was reconstructing the presence absence pattern of these, uh, these uh, of each ortholog for each uh, ancestral species. I mean that uh, each branching point of the phylogenetic tree. And in order to do that, we used uh, this kind of uh, probabilistic model in uh, which models the state change between the uh, two states, the presence and absence of each ortholog. And it, this model in contains uh, two different parameters of the transition rate. And then by using this model, uh, we can independently reconstruct the presence or absence of each ortholog for each ancestral species independently. So after getting the uh, reconstructed results of the gene content for ancestors, uh, we next conducted the prediction of gene gains and losses for every metabolic ortholog by using the Evodictor framework we developed. So Evodictor is designed to predict uh, gene, gain, gene gain or loss occurrence at each branch of the phylogenetic tree by, uh, from the input information of the gene content of the parental species of the predicted branch. And this gene content is represented as that 0, 1 vector. And then the Evodictor predicts the gene gain probability or gene loss probability occurring at that branch. And this prediction is conducted using the relatively simple machine learning model, the logistic regression and random forest. And by this setup, the predictor can learn which genes tend to be present or absent just before gain or loss of a particular ortholog. And predictor can predict which species will likely to gain or lose a gene from the current gene set information. So uh, by using this Evodictor framework, we next conducted the cross-validation of gene gain or loss predictability. So here, as an example, I will, uh, I will explain the predicting gene gain of one ortholog, the GI. And what we did was uh, for it, uh, well, first we split the branches of the phylogeny into two groups the training branches and the test branches. And then uh, we conducted the model training with the training branches. Uh, in order to do that, we first listed the parental gene content information and the occurrence of uh, gene gain or gene loss uh, for each branch of the training branches. And then after listing, the, listing, listing those input information pair, uh, we can uh, we train the evolutive model independently for each ortholog. And then uh, we tested the uh, predictability by, uh, by using the predictor to, uh, to predict the gene gain probability from the uh, parental gene content of each tested branch. And then uh, after getting the predicted gain probabilities, we compare that gain probability with the actual occurrence of the gene gain at each tested branch and calculated the AUC to measure the predictability. So the AUC here is the area under the ROC curve. And the, uh, we can say it's predictable if this AUC value is over 0 0.5. And this is the result of the AUC measurement. And each dot here is the AUC of each ocelot group. And for both prediction model we tried, uh, both gene gain losses uh, showed AUC distribution above 0 0.5. So we can say that both gene gain and both gene, uh, the gene loss uh, were predictable for metabolic enzyme genes. And also very interestingly, uh, we can see the AUCs of gene gain is higher than AUC of gene losses in both predictive models. So we can say that gene gain is more predictable than gene losses. So as, an, as a cause of this, uh, we are thinking that the gene loss usually occurs under relaxed, relaxed selection. So after the removal of the selective pressures, 
uh, one gene can be lost any time, so which will cause the unpredictability. And next, we saw the AUC distribution of genes for every metabolic function. So interestingly, AUCs uh, significantly varied among functions. So this suggests that the strengths of those evolutionary rules formed by shared pressures of constraints uh, differs among metabolic functions. So uh, in this result I showed so far, we measured the predictability by randomly splitting the training and test branches. And so next, we split the branch in a different way or phylum wise manner to verify the evolutionary rules shared across different phyla. So here, uh, we conducted what we call the hold one phylum out validation by picking one phylum to test, uh, to define test branches and treat all the other phyla to get the training branches. And then we conducted the same procedure for model training and the predictability test. So in this setup, a predictor can predict gene gain and loss based on the evolution of different phyla. So it will be predictable only when, it will, uh, only if there are evolutionary patterns shared across different phyla. And this is the result of this, uh, the AUC measurement in this setup. And as expected, AUCs were lower than the previous result but interestingly, they were still significantly over 0.5 for most tested phyla. So this suggests that there are evolutionary patterns shared across different phyla and a predictor can detect those evolutionary patterns. So as a short summary here, the, uh, we could say that the predictor can predict metabolic evolution by gene gain losses by cross validation. And also uh, there are patterns of evolutionary order shared across different phyla. So here, I would like to take questions. So please ask me if you have questions. Great, I have a question and I can also, um, you know, as I'm asking, uh, mm -hmm. feel free to type questions in the chat or raise your hand. Ming, I see mm -hmm. you have a hand raised, but I'm not sure if that's from earlier. Um, okay, so my first question is, um, you do ancestral, uh, state reconstruction for the presence and absence of genes. And I was yes. curious when you're using that information in your model, um, are you using like zero one ancestor states or are you using kind of like a posterior probability of the inferred state? Here, uh, we use the, the zero one information. So we simplify or we binalized the posterior mm -hmm. probabilities to simplify or to help the interpretation of the, the ancestral inference uh, result. Okay, great. And then I think you might have mentioned this earlier, but right now you're focused on um, single copy orthologs, right? And that's why uh, it's a zero or one because you don't need to keep track of uh, like counts for the number of copies. I understand. Well, actually now we are uh, looking at all the orthologs so actually, uh, if, uh, even if there are multiple copies, we, uh, we just treat it as present. So uh, we, we uh, simplify this, uh, this kind of uh, multiple copies to only one, uh, to, treat as, to treat as only one. So yeah. Okay, it, cool. So simplify. that could be like a future work would be looking at different copies um, right. as well. Yeah, and then my last question, um, and then I guess I'll give other people a chance, um, mm -hmm. is, uh, so you had two kind of experimental validations. Yes. One, uh, which I thought were very interesting, one is where you looked uh, kind of about cross predictability, basically going across phyla, and then the other was a random split of yes. branches. Yes. I was curious if you did the random split of branches test, mm -hmm. kind of like within a phyla. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? Because maybe um, training on a particular phylum mm -hmm. would give better test accuracy on a predict, uh, you know, in that same phylum, basically. Uh, I understand. So you're asking the uh, so you, you are, you're asking about randomly splitting of one particular phylum, for example. Yeah, yeah, like basically repeating analysis one, but within a phylum. So I think your your validation tests are probably more challenging, and I was wondering if you had tried this right. 
PD uh, is easier validation test case. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, well, actually, we, we haven't tested yet um, for that, for those phylum wise random splitting. But uh, well, it's, it's also an in, uh, interesting experiment. And that will be more easier uh, task to predict uh, for prediction, I think. Thank you for yeah, thank you for those questions. Okay, great. Are there are there questions from the audience before we move on? Ah, there's one in the chat. It says, "Good from Bo Feng." It says, "Good evening. I would like to ask if there is strategy on the selection of machine learning models. Why this article only compares two models?" Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. And yeah, so this is the uh, this is because uh, this is the first trial of those tasks of the prediction of gains and losses. So we here we only want to know if it's predictable or not. So uh, here we just tried a relatively simple model, and after this, I like we we wanted to to interpret what kind of evolutionary patterns are behind uh, biological system evolution. So we here, here we only use the relatively simple model to increase the interpretability of those models or keep the interpret interpretability of those models. So maybe the deep learning framework or other uh, prediction framework will be the next step. Thank you. Okay, and then Ming, oh, here I see your question in the chat. It says, mm -hmm. can uh, you say a bit more about the Evo Dictor mm -hmm. framework? Uh, yeah, now you can use the predictor framework. Uh, well, currently it's it just implements the long uh, logistic regression and the random forest. But uh, yeah, we are also thinking about implementing other models in the future. And now you you can use the predictor uh, via GitHub, for example. Yeah, GitHub. Thank you. Okay, great. So. Um... Naoki, I'm going to have you move on with your slides. And thank you to everyone for the engagement. Um, I would encourage you to keep putting uh, questions in the chat because we'll have another uh, place for questions after we see some more analysis. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Thank you for those questions. And I will next, uh, next talk about the interpretation of evolutionary patterns. So now, uh, we show that the evolution is predictable or gene gain, uh, gene gain or lost evolution is predictable. So there should be evolutionary patterns behind the biological system evolution or metabolic system evolution of bacteria, right? So we next try to interpre interpret what kind of evolutionary patterns are underlying the metabolic system evolution. So to answer to this question, we interpreted what kind of evolutionary patterns were learned in our predicted model. So to increase the interpretability of this model, here we slightly change the input information uh, from the presence absence of every gene or every ocelot to the number of possessed metabolic reactions in each functional module of reactions registered in KEG module database. So the KEG module database contains uh, a lot of entries of the functional unit of metab metabolism. And uh, each functional unit is so for example, the glycolysis and citrate cycle, as, as you can see here. And also, uh, and then uh, we, we use this model at, and, uh, and we train the, uh, we train this evolution model to, uh, we, we train this model with the older branches of the phylogeny. And then uh, we evaluated the feature importance score of each functional module of each keg module for prediction for gene gain or loss of every ocelot. So by this procedure, uh, we can see that, we can see uh, which functional module strongly affects the gain or loss of particular metabolic gene. So first, uh, based on the analysis, we verified if the predictor learns biologically valid tendency of gene gains and losses. So here we analyze the feature importance rank of keg modules, including the predicted ocelogs. And we found that the presence or absence of those functionally related modules was highly important for both gene gains and losses in, uh, for many or for most ocelogs. 
most predicted ortholog. And in detail, the possession of those functional modules facilitates the gene gains, but inhibits gene losses for each predicted ortholog. And these uh, tendencies are more consistent to the previous studies, uh, su suggested from previous studies. So uh, we can say that evolutionary can learn biologically valid evolutionary patterns supported with uh, previous studies. And ne we ne next, we further focused on the specific pathways and analyzed the evolutionary order of pathway acquisitions. So here we introduce our finding on an evolutionary pattern of xen xenobiotic degradation and we show the most predictable gene gain. And here we focused on the 15 functional module pairs, which construct, uh, construct a series of metabolic uh, pathways as shown here. And xenobiotics are the compounds that are not easily de uh, degraded by uh, such as complex metabolic compounds shown here. And uh, we measured, what we did was measuring the upstream modules feature importance for prediction of the gene gain of the downstream module. And the downstream module, I'm measuring the downstream module importance for prediction of the gene gain of the upstream module. So, but after measuring those important score of the upstream and the downstream module of these uh, functionally coupled pairs of modules, uh, we plotted the ranks of, the, of those modules in a, a scatter plot as shown here. And what we found was that the distribution of those dots was unexpectedly biased in the right bottom region. So this indicates that the possession of the upstream module is not always important for acquiring the downstream module. However, the downstream module is always important for upstream modules gene gain. So from this result, we hypothesized that the downstream is firstly acquired regardless of the upstream module's presence or absence, but the upstream module's gene gain is always facilitated by the presence of the downstream module. So there seems to be an evolutionary pattern of the pathway acquisition from the downstream to the upstream of those pathways. And to confirm that hypothesis, we next visualize the phylogenetic distribution of those downstream and the upstream modules. And here we show the two example pathways of xenobiotic degradations and also showing the phylogenetic distribution of those upstream and downstream pathways and downstream modules. And here we can see that, that each pathway is acquired from the red downstream and then blue upstream in many different lineages repeatedly. So we could confirm the up, downstream to the upstream pattern of pathway acquisition. So why downstream to the upstream? So we think that the pattern can be associated with functional dependency between upstream and downstream module. I mean, the upstream module cannot work without downstream modules. So for example, if one species only have the upstream module of the unsuranurate degradation pathway, the degradation pathway will stop at the catechol, right? So the species cannot utilize unsuranurate as a respiration substrate. On the other hand, if a species only have the downstream, it will utilize the uh, catechol as a respiration substrate, so it can be adapted. So by acquiring from the downstream to the upstream, uh, the, the species can extend their uh, metabolizable compounds by each acqui acquisition of pa uh, pathway modules. So uh, that, that order of evolution will be more easy to occur. So uh, from, this, uh, from this discussion, we can, see, we can say that there, there might be an evolutionary constraint by, uh, formed by functional dependency among genes. And also there are various models of pathway evolution proposed previously, like the novel invention, retroevolution, and pathway duplication. And the pattern we found is following the retroevolution model in which the uh, metabolic pathways evolve from the end product to the starting material. And this model is originally proposed for the novel evolution of the uh, by d gene duplications. However, it is quite interesting to see the same pattern in a metabolic evolution in bacteria repeating by horizontal gene transfer. 
So now uh, we interpreted the causes of evolution like patterns as physiological constraints or intrinsic constraints, right? However, there also can be extrinsic or environmental factors to cause the evolutionary patterns, especially when the habitats of species changes in the same order in different lineages. So in order to verify the association between gene gain order and habitat changes across phylogenetic trees, we need to get habitat information for every extant species. So it may sound difficult, but now we can utilize massive metagenomic data set from diverse environments on the earth. So we can infer the habitats of each extant species based on this meta, uh, metagenomic data set. So here we infer the habitats of extant species using a database called PROC Atlas. The PROC Atlas is a collection of 16 nest rRNA sequences in shotgun metagenomics of diverse environments. And we utilize the pipeline provided by PROC Atlas which conducts blast search of 16 nest RNA sequence of every species against PROC Atlas dataset. And then the pipeline scores the habitat preference of each species for every environment. And after conducting this analysis, we extracted five different environments shown here um, whose habitat preference is co uh, well correlated with the number of reactions for xenobiotic degradation possessed in each species. So these uh, the degradation pathways of xenobiotics seem to be acquired in these five uh, environments. And then we further conducted the ancestor habitat estimation to analyze the order of habitat changes and the association with those uh, pathway acquisition order. And here we utilize the same model as for the gene presence or absence reconstruction. And after that, we tested the association between the habitat and acquisition frequency of every orthodox to infer which environment facilitates the gene gain of upstream and the downstream modules. And by, by those series of analysis, what we found was that uh, inter very interestingly, the upstream and the downstream modules are actually acquired in different environments, especially for critical mediated degradation pathways. In short, uh, the downstream is acquired mainly in, acquired in soil, but the upstream is mainly acquired in plant-associated environments such as plant or rhizospheres. So these results suggest a model causing evolutionary patterns of the uh, down, downstream to the upstream pathway acquisition. So in this model, the multiple species extend their habitats from the soil to the plant-associated environments or their approaching to the plants and the downstream and the upstream module is acquired before and after inhabiting the plant associated environment, respectively. So this model is, so, uh, and also this model is consistent to the fact that the plants are known to emit xenobiotics degraded by those blue upstream modules. So in this way, the common habitat changes from the soil to the plant associated environments can cause the shared evolutionary orders of the pathway acquisition as well as uh, the functional dependency, as I, as I said. So uh, in this analysis too, uh, we could say that the evolutor learns biologically interpretable evolutionary patterns explained by functional dependency among genes and also the habitat changes. So here again, I would like to take questions. So please ask me if you have any questions. So I'm going to start us off again to give everyone a time to put questions in the chat or to, to raise their hand. So um, I was hoping we could go back to slide 35 just to make sure I'm understanding everything. Mm -hmm. um, so first off, this is like a really beautiful, all of your visualizations are really lovely. And okay. What I notice here, right, is that, you know, you're seeing similar patterns um, across the phylogeny. And so kind of my understanding from what you're saying is that we can see similar patterns across the tree, maybe because of similar habitat changes or things of that nature rather than, um, right, so there could be similar ev evolutionary patterns across the tree because of these uh, downstream to upstream pathways plus habitat changes? 
Uh, so, sorry, uh, uh, what's your question again? Sorry. Um, it's, it's that, you know, often when we're talking about evolution, yeah, it was poorly phrased. Often we're talking about evolution, people try to think about things very parsimoniously, right? But here mm -hmm, right. you're seeing similar patterns across the tree that like you really couldn't explain in a parsimony framework. And the reason is because they can happen in parallel across the tree because of shared habitat changes. Would that be like one interpretation or hypothesis from your work? Yes, yes, that's that's an one interpretation of those evolutionary patterns. And also another interpretation is the evolutionary constraint by the functional dependency between the upstream and the downstream. So both uh, both interpretation can be done for these results. And for for now we cannot distinguish those uh, two effects. So both can be they both can affect those evolutionary pattern, but maybe uh, well, but but it well it might happen well uh, but maybe uh only one can cause the evolutionary pattern so we, we cannot know this uh, we can know or we cannot distinguish the evolutionary cause of those patterns uh only from these results okay great thank you so much thank you All right, I'm not seeing any questions. So let's go ahead and move on. I think you have a third and oh wait, I see one now. Uh, Ming says, it makes sense biologically from downstream to upstream, but your focus is on gene gain over gene loss. Mm -hmm. For tumor evolution, mm -hmm. which more on gene mutation or copy num number aberration, any idea or possibility to expand the framework learning tumor evolution patterns? Oh, this is a great question. So yeah, I guess the yeah. high level is about the generalization of this framework for problems in, in tumor phylogenetics. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's quite interesting. And yeah, that for tumor evolution, um, yeah, we, maybe we can also uh, detect the, some evolutionary patterns over there, such as the mutation in driver gene first, and then the uh, other well, mutation in other genes causing directly the cancers, for example. So, uh, so that kind of evolutionary pattern can also be detected by evolutor, and uh, the uh, the interpretation of those uh, those pattern can well depends on each target or each analysis target. So, uh, yeah, so it's possible to analyze the evolutionary pattern of the cancers uh, if we have the DNA sequences of each cell or each cancer cell, and also the lineage information, I think. I just wanna jump in and say, I guess the thing unique to tumors is that you're calling variants in reference to a healthy cell. So you actually can say, is a mutation present or absence, which makes it feel more natural to fit an analysis of even mutation data within your framework, right? Since you're to look at presence and absence. Yeah, yeah. Well. Well, instead of presence or absence, uh, we can also treat the uh, mutation about well, existence of mutations or not. Yeah. So yeah, so it's also possible to treat those uh, DNA, DNA sequence evolution also. Yeah, thank you. All right. Go on to, I think this is the final analysis. Analysis yeah. three? Yes. Okay. Okay, so lastly, uh, so I, we assess the future evolution prediction. So now the evolutionary is known to, well, what was revealed to, uh, to learn the evolutionary patterns biologically interpretable. So we finally uh, assessed, uh, uh, assessed if the evolutionary can also predict the future evolution. So here we want to assess the predictability of future gene gain and future gene loss. However, it's quite tricky because uh, we cannot know the information of future evolution rate right, without time machine. So uh, here, uh, instead, we verify the hypothesis that the extant species predicted to gain or lose a gene with high probabilities often includes strains that have already acquired or lost that gene. So in other words, we, we measure the predict predictability of ongoing evolution which will lead to the future evolution. So here again, I will explain how to measure the predictability of gene gain for one orthodox in this situation. 
So we first trained the Bodicta model with all the branches of the phylogeny here. And then we predicted the gene gain probabilities for every extant species. So here, importantly, uh, for gene gain, we predicted gene gains for species whose representative strain does not have the predicted ortholog. And next, we analyzed the occurrence of ongoing gene gain or loss by looking at the pan genome of each species. So in bacteria, different strains of the same species often have different gene content. So we analyzed those intraspecies variations of gene presence or absence to analyze the ongoing evolution of each extant species. So here we say a species is, a, is showing ongoing gene gain of the predicted ortholog if any one of non-representative strains of the an analyzed extant species actually possess that ortholog, even though the representative genome does not have that ortholog. And also, uh, uh, and on the other hand, we say a species is not showing the ongoing evolution uh, if no representative, no, no non-representative strain possess that ortholog. So after annotating those species showing ongoing gene gain or ongoing gene loss, we finally compare the predicted probability and the ongoing evolution profile to calculate AUC to measure the predictability of ongoing evolution. And this is the result of the AUC measurement. And here we here again we could find uh, we could see that the overall distribution of AUC is over 0.5 for most orthologs. So uh, we can say that the predictor successfully predicted the spe species under ongoing gene gains and gene losses. And also uh, these are the ex example results for two different metabolic orthologs. And we can here. I'm showing the future gene gain probability as bar plots for each extant species. And the purple bars means the species under ongoing gene gain. And here we can see that the purple bars are all, uh, usually higher than the gray other bars. So we can see that I would if the successfully predicting species under ongoing gene gain. So here, uh, from this result, we can say that the ongoing or maybe the future evolution is predictable from the past evolution. And based on this observation, we can discuss that the past long-term evolution and the ongoing short-term evolution by gene gain and loss share actually shared a common rules. Uh, because the ongoing evolution can be predictable by training the past evolution. So from uh, based on this idea, uh, we can we can say that if we can apply this evolutive method to antibiotic resistance genes, we may achieve the risk assessment of pathogens, such as predicting gene gain, of, um, such as predicting resistance gene gain by horizontal gene transfer of a resistance gene. And by that, uh, by that risk assessment, we can discuss for which species we should develop new drugs and which should be quite valuable for med medicine field. So from this analysis three, uh, we can we could say that, that we may predict future and at least ongoing gene gain or loss predict, uh, evolution in nature. And also the evolutionary rules are shared between past and ongoing evolution. So lastly, I would like to talk about the future perspectives based on this work. So my message here is if a predictor is a quite versatile framework and all you need, need is a lineage and a profile data to use if predictor. So we may utilize Evo Dictor to analyze diverse biological data sets. So in this study, we conducted prediction of gene content evolution by gene gains and losses. But for example, we may predict complex phenotypic evolution, such as butterfly wing patterns. And in this case, we need a phylogenetic tree data and the presence or absence profiles of each phenotypic uh, feature for each species. So the, uh, these days, uh, researchers are now developing massive uh, phenotypic databases for some taxa, such as bacteria, plants, and birds. So a predictor can be useful to analyze the predictability of phenotypic evolution based on those uh, massive databases and the mega phylogenies. And also, uh, we can use a not only to phenotypic traits, but also for molecular evolution. For example, uh, let's think about preparing a large phylogenetic gene tree 
and the protein structures of homologous, all, all homologous genes. It's because now we can retrieve protein structures predicted by AlphaFold2 or ESM4. So it is now possible to utilize the predictor to extract rules of protein structure evolution if we can uh, list, list the features of those structures. And also, um, as well as gene sets, phenotypic, phenotypic, uh, phenotypic, uh, phenotypic evolution and protein structures, we may also uh, utilize the predictor to analyze transcriptomic evolution. So a recent study conducted the ancestral state reconstruction from RNA sequence profiles for uh, RNA sequencing profiles of current species for every organ. And in these data sets, uh, the number of species are relatively small. However, there are vast number of genes uh, which is analyzable. So it can be possible to extract rules of changes of ex expressed organs during evolution shared across variety of genes. And furthermore, we may apply a predictor not only, or not only to evolution, but also to developmental process in the future. A recent study, uh, well, recent studies are now able, uh, enabling us to trace high resolution cell lineage information and single cell RNA uh, expression profile uh, simultaneously. So we may extract patterns of cell state changes order, uh, change, cell state change order during uh, developmental processes. So in this way, they, my message here is that predictor can be used to analyze via various biological data sets in the future, and it will be more and more useful as we can obtain larger lineage, lineage data set and the profile data sets. And now you can use our predictor software tool from GitHub, and uh, we are now still actively developing predictor, so please give us any issues and pull requests. And on the GitHub, you can see step-by-step -step sample calls for data set generation for machine learning and future selection, cross-validation, and future, uh, future prediction. So here, I would like to finish my talk, and I would like to thank all the members of the Iwasaki lab and the Yachie lab, and especially for the Professor Iwataro Iwasaki, who is a supervisor now, and also the Dr. Nozomu Yachie, who is a previous supervisor of me. So thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask one more question again, partly just to get everyone, um, you know, in the chat time time to type. So um, for this last uh, set of things focused on expression uh, data, where um, you know, you might have something real valued or you might have counts. Are you uh, kind of exploring ways to work with data that's not binarized or um, are you first looking at binarizing the data? Yeah, thank you for your question. And currently, Evodictor only uh, treat the uh, binarized data set. However, uh, we can also, uh, I'm also thinking about the the treating the those continuous continuous or uh yeah continuous data set in the future uh because we can uh, well at least we can infer the ancestral state of those continuous data set mm. so so we, after that we can uh we we might model the the next next change of the the continuous level of their expression level and uh, based on the the previous expression profile. So that kind of modeling can be done in the, in the, as a next step in the future. Yeah, thank you. Great. So Ming, Ming has a question more about the, um, the tool EvoDictor itself. Uh -huh. So the question is whether um, it's implemented in R or Python. Basically, could you describe more about what a potential user um, would need to work with to get the tool running? Uh huh. Thank you for your question. And uh, now the evolutor is implemented only in Python. So uh, yeah, you can you can I, I think you can easily use the uh, this software uh, by use uh, by by installing this soft uh, software uh, and also uh, installing the dependencies using Conda Conda or some some other uh, yeah Conda or some other environment. And also. Um, 
yeah, the potential users here uh, will be the, the well, all, well, the genome evolutionary biologists so far because they're diverse uh, genome information uh, the genome information data set uh, and to analyze the evolutionary patterns. And uh, so I, I, in the future, uh, I would like to extend the users, user range for more diverse bio, uh, evolutionary biology studies, uh, bio, biology researchers, and also the developmental researchers. Yeah, thank you. I have a related question. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, part of your work's developing this tool, but a large part, right, is doing all of this data set curation, which can be very time consuming. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious if you're kind of uh, distributing um, any data sets that, um, that the community could use in analyses, basically kind of processed versions of, of KEG, for example. Ah, uh, yeah. Th uh, thank you for your question. Well, actually, now now I'm not providing the, that kind of process data set. I'm only providing the the software tool itself. How, however, uh, yeah, it, I'm I'm also uh, thinking about those um, if, well, those processing a uh, processed data set, providing those processed data set before because yeah, it's also time consuming for the gene annotation, gene annotation and also the ancestral reconstruction. So yeah, in the future I will I will do that. Yeah, thank you. 